My name is Alan Clues. Uh, I'm uh, here in Toronto, Canada. It's late morning and I'm talking with Francis Licorice in the United Kingdom, in England. Um, can you just uh, uh, give a little background about yourself, Francis, uh, and it, particularly in terms of the work, uh, in terms of uh, your interest in the Gurdjieff teachings and... Uh, of course. Um, I, I first encountered Gurdjieff I had a book called The Fourth Way by P.D. Uspensky. Uh, and unfortunately, I, I read it when I was 17, shortly after my father's death. And it had a very life-changing impact, but at that time I found it really it plunged me into despair, to be honest, <laughs> because it seemed hopeless. It seemed uh, subsequently. I mean, I've, I've studied studied the teachings as best one can on and off, pretty well consistently since then, and I'm you know I'm in my sixties now, um, and. I have to say that for me, the the fourth way, and particularly the Gurdjieff, Spensky is one thing. And once you get to know Gurdjieff from his books, on see it, Women of the Rope, all these kind of other books, it it, it changes the perspective one may have. Mm -hmm. uh, I can honestly say it's been changing. You know, the, mm -hmm. It opens things up and it puts people it puts life very much into perspective you know, um, and into context. What are we? You know, everything else seems to matter. Yeah. I've got a cat sitting here. Yeah, I have a dog over here. He's you know you can kind of see a bit of fur in the corner. Um, and, um, just watching us. And so that's kind of introducing into the work, which. I, mean, I won't say by any means that uh, I know very much about it. I've, I've read Beelzebub, or rather I've struggled with Beelzebub. Um, I've read it twice. Okay. <laughs> rather, as I say, the first time I read it, I sort of stared blankly at the pages. Yeah. Um, the first time I read it, I screamed at it. Absolutely. And I wrote all these marks in the margin going, this is the most ridiculous thing I've heard, and how can he say this? And the second time I felt so ashamed that I had made all those comments the first time. But you were a musician, are a musician. Uh, and yes. um, I recall um, a while, you know, this is quite a while ago, about a year ago, talking to you. And Beelzebub Tales changed your life yes um, well it, it, it the whole thing changed I, I read um the fourth way was the first book i read that led mm -hmm. on to search of the miraculous which i found extraordinary it was you know of course i read it and it made absolute sense well don't get me wrong the the, the science in the middle i struggle with for a long mm -hmm. time so, mm -hmm. The, the, the basic idea that the notion, well, it's not even an idea, is it? Um, the premise of it, I made complete sense. And I thought, of course, this makes sense of everything. Um, and it went very deep. Then, how shall I put that? Yes, I was a musician for a long time, professional musician. Um, now, I'm a, I'm a therapist. I specialize in drug and alcohol therapy. So you can kind of do the math, as you yeah. say. <laughs> Um, and I now try and bring, as far as possible, without being overt, the work and the working groups. Uh, and it's very useful. There are some very, very useful tools, I think, in the work. I mean, there are two things that, uh, you know, when I talk about to people about previous discussions that I've had with you, um, one is the utilization of the work, yeah. in a sense, covertly uh, in your uh, work as an addictions counselor. Yeah. Um, particularly, you told me that uh, you tell all your clients that they're going to, I don't know how you phrase it, they're going to get to a me point yes. where it could be six weeks, six months, six years something is going to happen that could knock them 
Yes. Well, think there are two points where things will happen. One is the me point, which happens fairly early on. Uh, and that is usually something that comes in from outside in a negative spiral. I'll explain that in a minute. The yeah. other point is much further on. It can be six, seven, eight years on. That's the far point where complacency kicks in. And people believe they can turn to what they were doing mm -hmm. and be able to deal with it. That's a different thing. But in the early recovery, I, I, I think recognizing the certainty of the entry of the design force at the me far gap um, it can be a very, very useful. I mean, what I say, how, how I put it is look, I tell, I tell them that in your lives there are two laws that operate one law of sevens. And the other is the law of three. And they go, what's the law of seven? And I said, well, it's, it's like this. Think of a rainbow, for example. Uh, rainbow's the easier one. It's because it, it, it's a visual. Because if you think red, orange, yellow, red, orange, yellow are pretty much the same kind of a colour. Do, re, mi. To get to green, something has to come in from the outside. Blue has to be introduced. And it comes in from outside. It is not inherent in red, in orange, or in yellow. So something comes in. And this will happen in your lives. Imagine writing a book, and I'll ask the group, has anybody ever written a book? And they say, yes, I have. And I say, okay. When you start writing a book, you have inspiration. An impulse to write a book comes from somewhere. You get an idea, you get an inspiration, you get a notion. This is the affirming force. This is the, the first way. And you start to do work. You make a decision then to do the, to write the book. You gather all the materials and then you actually start writing and then you're at what I would call me, the me point. Invariably something will happen. You will make the mistake of showing the book to your mother or you'll finish it even, you maybe send it to a publisher and the denying force will come in from the outside. And unless you are aware of this and awake to this, you'll, all your internal, what I call the internal jails will be activated you have self-doubt, low self-esteem, you'll get angry, shamed, whatever, and you'll go back to the beginning. This is the story of a lot of life around in the same circles. And it's the same in recovery from alcohol. Let's say you're drinking and it's become a problem. Something in you at some point recognises it's a problem. You get an impulse. This is the affirming dough. This is the affirming force. You're at point nine in the end. Then you make a decision to stop. You put the work in, you go to therapy, you um, go to AA meetings, you do all this work. And then something happens. Your wife goes on holiday. The denying force comes in from the outside. And unless you bring in the reconciling force by going to AA meetings, taking it to therapy, you will you, you run the risk of relapsing and going right back to the beginning again. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, if I use it like that, and at some point something will happen. One person, it's the way of things, it's, it's, it's the universal law, it's the law of three. Whenever you start something, inevitably you invoke its opposite, and that will come at this point. And it's knowing how to do that and having the resources in place, being prepared for it. And if you're prepared for it, you can do something about it. Um, and one of the questions I always ask is, what do you need to get out of jail? What are the three essential elements to escaping from prison? And they never get it. And the first one is always you recognise you're in jail. That's the first thing. The second one is you need to want to escape, not just adapt to being in prison. And the third is that you need outside help. And when the denying force comes in, it will activate all your internal jailers, all the things that want to keep you stuck, low self-esteem, resentment, shame, all the stuff that's right at the far end of the octave, um, get activated, rise up and do its best. Now, if you know this, and if you are aware of this, you, you can begin to detach from them, you can begin to separate. And Use the reconciling force, going to meetings, talking to someone, reading a book, something that's carrying that reconciling force. Or you can just sit it out, that's another thing. You can do. And you can move on. Once you're across the gap, you'll finally have a momentum until you hit last. 
and then other forces will come in, but I don't deal with that at all. That makes sense. It does. I'm a Gurdjieffian, so it makes eminent sense to me. Um, so, uh, what kind of uh, sort of uh, me gaps do your clients typically experience? Um, it can be all sorts of things. I mean, the classic one is something apparently negative happens. You know, the breakup of a relationship. This is this will be carrying the denying force. The breakup of a relationship, the, the loss of a job, a demotion at work, something, a death, a loss. They're usually at this stage negative or perceived as negative. So they embody the affirming force at the beginning i've got a problem i'm going to stop uh, they try and work with willpower and this and that and the denying force smacks them from outside it it, it just hits them and unless they are able to bridge the affirming and denying which the bridging the higher blends with the lower to meet in the middle they just then fall off the wagon, so to speak. We go back to the beginning. We go back to dough. If you think of dough as an impulse, dough is, I see dough, the original dough, the nine on the Enneagram. At the start of the octave, is it can be felt as an impulse, inspiration, it can be felt as regret or remorse, or something very powerful. The ray is a decision, it's a personal decision. You can feel the impulse, then you can decide to do something about it. The me is actually beginning to do the work in terms of, let's say, having therapy, uh, going to AA meetings, changing one's life. And it's at that point, usually, when it can be internal. You know, the, it doesn't have to come from outside. It, the denying force can come from outside. Very often triggered by an external event. Yes, sorry, carry on. Well, it's a common event, really, I mean, it's, yes. So what would some of the internal uh, dimensions of the denying force be within the clients that you work with? Okay, um, cravings, mm -hmm. particularly with certain drugs, because with certain drugs, let's take cocaine, for example, the cravings don't kick in straight away. They can come like anything up to 42 days later. So some people are doing really well. And then a craving for cocaine may start, and they're taken by surprise. That's one. Um, ambivalence is another one. Okay. <laughs> where somebody's doing it for somebody else, and they don't really believe this, and there comes a point where it gets too much internally. They can't, literally, they can't be bothered anymore to, to maintain the effort required to keep going. And there's all sorts of internal things. Um, illness. If there is which there often is these days, dual diagnosis such as bipolar disorder, ADHD, that can contribute to it, a sort of cycle. Uh, the moon, I noticed the moon has a big impact. You mean by the full moon, um, the moon cycle? Yeah, the full moon and the new moon, yes. They're both, you know, I look on it, and that's when the moon opens its jaws and sucks all the... Uh, <laughs> And that can happen. I, I, mean, I, can, I do warn people, particularly women, to be very aware of the moon cycle. See what's going on, because at certain points in the moon cycle, you may be find yourself very vulnerable. Okay, so, oops, go ahead. No, after you. Okay. Um, so, dough is like, I think I have a problem. It could be. And, and then Ray is, I've got to, do something about this yes. and then me is the actual attempting to do something about it and within the law of octave at the me point unless there is some kind of outside thing that can come in to allow us to continue with that energy we can kind of fall off and for you you see this also as the denying force just something negative happens some so the, the the outside force can be both positive and negative the negative one knocks people off their path it knocks them off of the sobriety uh desire and they end up relapsing yes. um and then the 
the, the reconciling force, the, uh, the other force can come in at that point? At law, yes. At law. And that's often several years later. Ah, okay. And that, that can often, I mean, I, complacency in, in long-term recovery is the biggest form, the biggest cause of relapse, you know. I can handle this. Yeah. We, you know, Gurdjieff says we are third force blind. Mm -hmm. Very often, I think the third force flows through us in terms of what we think of as our gifts, our talents, our strengths. And we can mistake those for, for hours when it's mm -hmm. actually, I, I, I do believe, I'm, I'm, I'm open to being very wrong about that. Yeah, yeah. That is the manifestation of the third force. So, you know, let's say you, you've stopped drinking, you haven't had a drink now for seven or eight years, right? You're at your daughter's wedding. Somebody offers you a glass of champagne and you may think, well, oh, you know, I can, drink, I can handle this, of course, again. it's just one glass of champagne. I can always get back on the wagon tomorrow. Everything will be okay. Do you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. And that's the other dangerous point, I think, in recovery. But I know someone who actually I knew I was a friend of the daughter who got married and uh, her father hadn't had a drink in 20 years and he was plastered and uh, um, just down again. Um, so I, I see that in terms of the law of three as the reconciling force. Okay. In, how shall I put it? mismanaged <laughs> okay how do you weave this in uh with your clients yeah um do you just sort of give them a kind of a nebulous warning and do you actually ever properly discuss the octaves and the law of three and the law of seven and i do as far as i in context as, and as far as you know the context of me understanding it you know don't get me wrong i don't profess yeah. Uh, yes i actually describe it you know there are these obvious i mean I, I i make very glib examples here's an example of the law of three i will say okay. i have an impulse of the affirming force comes in oh i'm going to go to the seaside immediately the denying force comes in oh it's a long way away the reconciling force is i can get a train <laughs> And, uh, and it's surprising how people do take to this. They, they actually really like the idea of these. It depersonalizes it. Yeah, yeah. It's very useful. Um, it makes it not about their identity. It doesn't mean that they're weak, or but it, it means that there is something happening which is ubiquitous. It's universal. It's going to happen. Don't be frightened of it gather the resources to be able to move on from it. And the reconciling force may be carried by your sponsor in AA, your therapist in the AA meeting, even reading a book, bring in the reconciling force, if you choose to do that. So, yes, I'm actually quite clear about, you know, the Holy Trinity, Brahma, Shiva, Vishnu, whichever religion you look at has these three forces. And they are every day fundamental forces just like gravity or electricity there they are nearly everything and mostly uh the, i found that the clients really like to take this it's something concrete they can cling to and it it's something they can be aware of so yeah I, I, I'm useful. Um, I, I like that dimension so rather than you're a failure and how could you do this because one of the things about the gurdjieff uh, teachings is that a normal man lacks will and the ability to do and we are prisoners to all sorts of extraneous external forces in life that just knock us this way and that way and so you bring that awareness in to the addiction recovery process so you know it's not like i can't believe it i failed i'm just such a loser uh, i'll never get my life right and rather than take it as a personal weakness it's you know just what was that thing that came and knocked you sideways and what else could you have done yeah how could you have done it differently okay at this in this occasion when this came in you chose to pick Sorry, that was my phone. I just turned it off. 
uh, uh, you know, you've you reached this point here, you're at this junction here, you went down the same old familiar road and it's brought you to the same old familiar place. Why don't you try going down the other road? And next time, you try the other road and see what happens. Um, yeah, and it, it, as, it, as, as, you, as you picked up, it, it depersonalizes, it yeah. makes it not about identity. Yeah. You know, and also, I make it clear, you know, this isn't easy. It is mm -hmm. powerful forces, you know, and they will activate your own internal, what I call your own internal jailers. Yeah. Other very strong and very subtle. Yeah, yeah. Um, how would you, what, what kind of internal jailers are we talking about? Shame. 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 Resentment. Low self-esteem. Uh, procrastination, all these things that keep us locked into the same self-considering, internal considering, as good as you know, being worried what people think of you. Uh, all these sorts of things are, when we come up against them, and some of them go right back, some of them are uh, a childhood trauma, some of them are even transgeneration, way, way back, I mean, that's another. You know, and when, for example, as I said, if, if you take the example of a man, he's given up drinking, he's done all the work, he's at me, he's doing the work, he's going to meetings, and his wife leaves him. Now, the, the spectrum of horrors will arise in him, you know, from early abandonment issues, rage, resentment, jealousy, fear, all this kind of stuff. And they can to be quite difficult to deal with. Uh, and the risk is that they'll just push him back. Is, is that where you come in to, you know, at those points when that happens, you just talk about these internal jailers and make people realize that they have not just impersonal forces outside themselves, but also things that are implanted within themselves that just rise up and just take control and pull them back down again. That's exactly right. I mean, you put it very well. Alan. Yes, that's exactly what, what it is. They don't have to do that. Um, some, it may get difficult. It may get very difficult. You know, if you're dealing with early childhood uh, abandonment, abuse, mm -hmm. it's going to hurt. And you can do it. Um, and you can get through it. You just need to find the, the right, in good GF in terms, you need to bring in the reconciling forces. Yeah. Oh. Um. Yeah, no, this is uh, fascinating. I know a lot of people are going to find it very interesting. Uh, um, so thank you for that. The other well, thing, the, the other thing that people, when I mentioned you know some of the conversations I've had with you, the other thing that people want to know more about is uh, you said that the Lord's Prayer yes. contains the octave. It, it, it describes a descending octave, yes. Okay, can you explain this? Uh, yes, I can. The Lord's Prayer is very old. In the movements, and it's worth looking this up on, the, on, on YouTube, in the movements contain a, a movement, and it's the oldest of all the movements. And there's a movement, there's a movement called the Big Seven, um, which is... Uh, how shall I put it? A physical representation of the Lord's Prayer. And there are seven different movements, and it's very, very old. Our teacher says it's over seven thousand years old. Okay. So the Lord's Prayer, if we look on it as a descending octave, the first is holy affirming, "Our Father who art in heaven." <laughs> so that's there. That's elsewhere. And that's then we have the, what you might call the T-Do gap, which is where things come into manifest. Do you know what I mean by the, the Do? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The first semitone, where actually manifestation is starting. Then number eight, hallowed be thy name. And this, in some sense, is the equivalent of, in the beginning, the word. Mm -hmm. The word of God is the, the first, if you like, the first sound, the manifestation of everything, uh, be it galaxies, stars, planets, um, beings, ideas, dreams, whatever it is. 
it's all contained with that, hallowed be thy name. It's still a very long way away. <laughs> thy kingdom come is basically the idea of Eden. And again, you have this in the Old Testament. <coughs> Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And that's at seven. Six, uh, it's a four of three. Um, if you think of it in the Enneagram, six is, is in the, one of the points of the triangle of the law of three. So it's outside the law of seven. That's not, but you know what I mean. And so six is last. Six is where the holy reconciling comes in. And that's a transition between one world and another. So th then we kind of move into five. We have our Father who art in heaven. That's there. So the first manifestation, the first kind of, the door of heaven, if you like, is the, the Do gap. Hallowed be thy name. You can take that as the first manifestation uh, of the first manifestation of the unmanifest, if you like. In the beginning, the world and the world. Yeah. Of thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Is um, the idea of paradise, if you like. Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, tempted by separation from God. And then you get six, which is basically being chucked out of Eden. If you like the banishment. It, it, if you want to take that metaphor. So, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Oh, as it is in heaven, I'll, I'll just... Yes. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is kind of the idea of paradise lost. Here we are, we're on earth now. Do you see what I mean? And we're <coughs> asking for things to be brought down. And then, if you think about this, then we're... Right into the um, into the physical world, with give us this day our daily bread. Yeah. Now, we're in, if you think of the the difference between our Father who art in heaven and give us this day our daily bread, the the physicality of that. So now we're we're solidly in the physical world, and then we're coming up to the new far gap which is where the physicality is actually thrown in completely. You know, we're actually making the track. Am I making any sense? It's quite difficult to explain this, but... Yeah, you are. Um, I'll ask you a few questions in a bit, but let's, uh, let's go through it. Um, so on, on, on four, we're on far. So, you know, we're sort of thoroughly... Then the denying force comes in. We're on three, which again is, 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 is outside of this. It's a... Nine, six, and three, as you, you well know, are the three points in the triangle of the law of three. <laughs> so we have the transition. <clears throat> and forgive us our trespasses. This separation from heaven means we're horrible to each other. You know, we, we don't have objective conscience. Uh, you know, the Ashi is so bringing to We don't know how to behave. We don't know who we are. Do um, you see what I mean? Yeah. We, we, we harm to ourselves, harm to our other, harm to others. And that's you know, forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. Then we have lead right back to the original dough, number one. Lead us not into temptation. It's a good story about that. About um, a king. Once there was a king who had this enormous market. And it was the market, universal market, and it was full of beautiful things. And there were a certain number of days where people could come in and they could buy things for, from this market. Yeah. And he has this market, and all the people come in and they all start buying things except for one man. And he just walks around looking at everything. And every day of the market, he does this. He never buys anything. And people are saying to him, Well, it's really important you buy something. The time's running out, there's going to be nothing left. No, no. At the end of the market, the last day, they asked him, well, what is it that we're going to buy? Well, where is the hand that made all these things? Where is the hand that started this market? The king. Well, I want to buy the king then. But if I buy the king, I can have all these things. He goes to the king, he says, right. It's your hand that's responsible for all that, so I want to buy you 
And the king says, well, you can't buy me for money. You can only buy me for love. So he serves the king. And this is a, the, the idea of lead us not into temptation. And then the last one is, but deliver us from evil. And then we're back at nine. We're back at the bottom dough. This evil isn't, you know, evil. We're talking about objected evil. In other words, uphold the absolute, not morally or, or what people have. You know, evil is a perception, um, but as the the, I suppose what is beyond the moon in the way of creation, the, the final dough, which is actually the beginning of the upward of the Does that make any sense at all? It does. So, our Father, who art in heaven. Yeah, that's the initial dough. That's, holy that's, that's the initial dough. And Mr. Gurdjieff actually says that in the Law of Octaves, when it goes down, the initial dough contains within it the energy necessary to bridge the C dough gap, where things generally go off the rails. So, our Father who art in heaven, then hallowed be thy name. Right. And you connect that to in the beginning was the Word. And, you know, the Word was God and the Word became flesh, um, John's Gospel. Yes. Um, so, that's sort of right at the metaphorically the point just immediately after the Big Bang, so to speak. If you want to, if you want to put it in those two Metaphorically yeah. speaking. Yes, the um, dough, or as you call it, the C-do gap, it would, I guess, be the Big Bang. You know, yeah. The, the coming into existence of the non non-existent. So yeah. to speak. I mean, within Hinduism, they talk about the unmanifest yes. becoming manifest. Absolutely, yes. Um, um, that's the point where it happens. So the hallowed be thy name is C or T? It's C. Uh, uh, so then we go down. Point eight on the Enneagram. Do re mi fa so la. In English it's T. Okay. I, I just go with the Gurdjieffi and like C12. And, uh, but you're a magician. Um, it's just, just, just one letter different. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, so you actually, so this is plotted out also on the Enneagram. Yes. So our Father who art in heaven, that would be nine. Yes. Then hallowed be thy name would be one. Yes. No, no, like, no. no. Oh, hallowed be thy name would be eight. We're, we're coming anti clock. Oh, okay. We're going the other way. Yes. Um, so eight, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come is seven. Yes. Uh, thy will be done is six, and thy six... Thy will be done is five. Oh. The six is the transition. Okay. So six is the inner triangle. Six is the, six is, is the reconciling force. Ah, uh, okay. Um, thy will be done, then five. Yeah. As it in heaven, four, give us this... Four is give us this day our daily bread. Okay. Five is thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Okay, uh, nine, eight, seven, and then we miss six. Okay, five, four, as it is in heaven. Yep. Then give us this day our daily bread is four. That's four. That's four. And then we come to the three point, which is the denying element. That's right. Um, and then two is forgive us our trespasses yes. as we forgive those who trespass against us. Yes. So that whole phrase, which is usually two separate lines in the Lord's Prayer, is really one point on the Enneagram. And, and that's two. And then... One is, and lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from. But deliver us from evil. So those. Evil is nine. Pardon? Evil is back to nine. Okay. Evil is the bottom dough, the last dough. Okay. Um, boy, I wish I, I mean, I, I will uh, take a moment, you know, to, one way, 
do the video, I'll do a section just actually mapping it out yes. on the Enneagram. The connections, which I won't go into, but the connections on the Enneagram, on the inner, the inner circuit, yeah. are really interesting. Um, okay. Um, so if we go up, um, but deliver us from evil is nine and lead us not into sorry to sorry. okay lead us not into temptation but deliver us right oh but deliver us from evil evil specifically is not evil is the 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 the, the opposite pole to our father who art in heaven okay ah okay from doe to doe yes. the one doe is our father which are who art in heaven and the other doe is evil objective evil yes not so so everything so and lead us not into temptation but deliver us is one yes and then the evil is the bottom dough yes that was uh, like on the moon on the ray of creation okay um okay i i will uh do, so do a little bit of work on this and just plot it out in terms of the enneagram so that we can see it and then also plot it out in terms of uh, the octave. Um, and it must fit on the ray of creation as well. Um, when, you, when you talked about evil being the moon, um, so from do to do down to the moon, um, it can be all plotted on there. It can, very much so. Um, oh. the, 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 the bit, the little doxology on the end, for thine is the kingdom, the power. And the yeah. That's a modern addition. It's yeah. Not, and yeah. it's worth having a look at, um, you can see it on YouTube, the Big Seven, uh, the movement of the Big the Seven. The Big Seven, okay. We, I will lo also link that as well. Um, representation of. Yeah. I, and, and, you know, I, I have a degree in religious studies, and uh, the way my professor said it, you know, he said, just imagine some monk, you know, our Father who art in heaven, and getting tired, and then just slipping a line in, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. And it wasn't there in the original prayer, as uh, comes came to us, as it was taught by Jesus to his disciples, and put down in the Gospels, that for thine is the power, the kingdom, and the glory, is actually a later addition and is not part of the real authentic prayer. And uh, so for those of you who have been adding that, it is a later addition. The you know scholars and the people who work on the Bible uh, have determined that it ends with the word evil. And uh, okay, um, thank you very much, uh, 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 Francis. Well, and, so they're not too garbled. <laughs> well, uh, you know, um, I will map it out as well. So there will be a pictorial representation, and uh, I'll create some kind of link so people can go to the uh, that movement's uh, seven thousand years old. Um, uh, this is going back to the original Christianity, uh, so to speak. Uh, Mr. Gritchie said, uh, you know, Egypt was Christian long before the birth of Christ. And there are all sorts of uh, people nowadays, uh, um, scholars, uh, he's, he's dead now, Alvin Boyd Kuhn, uh, who wrote, wrote The Lost Light. Um, uh, um, another one, he was uh, the religion editor for the Toronto Star, Tom Harper, who wrote a book called The Bacon Christ, looking at the Egyptian origins and roots of Christianity and the Trinity and all of that. So we're talking about something far more ancient than we've been led to believe, which is really the premise of esoteric Christianity as opposed to exoteric Christianity. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, okay, Francis, thank you very much. Very nice to see you again. It's nice to talk to you again. Thank you for asking. Okay, you take care, bye now. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Yes. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from 
evil. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. 